Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. We are presenting on our conference title, What to Expect When You're Expecting, Cultivating Student-Teacher Relationships Through Expectations and Feedback. My name is Anthony Munzing. I'm Charles, Charles Minky. Minky. I'm Christina Schuler. And, and I'm Anna Zappa. Great. So before we get started here today, I want to ask you a question. Wherever you're viewing from, I want you to think to yourself, when was a time a teacher has given you helpful feedback or clear expectations? Think about how that affected you or made you feel. With that in mind, let's get started here. So on the screen right now, you are seeing some familiar faces and all three of these professors here have something in common. First, they're all beloved people of ACE. And secondly, they model great use of technology to provide positive feedback to their students. It's personalized, it's constructive, and it's informative. They have high expectations and offer suggestions and guidance to help us reach them. Next up, we have a couple more familiar faces. Uh, this time it's handwritten. We see Dr. Beasley's words of encouragement and affirmation, which was very warm and motivating. And Dr. Madison's feedback emphasized great ideas and pointed to further questions, if you could read his handwriting. Dr. Madison used one of my papers as a model for class to use, and this pushed me as well um, as a student. These teachers made us feel connected to them and fostered relationships. In this presentation, we will explore how teacher expectations and feedback can foster positive student relationships and ultimately lead to improved academic achievement. Before we get started, we're gonna go over our agenda here. So first I will be going over our topic overview and framing. Next, we'll take a look at our first study which contains our expectations of students. Following that, we will have study number two which is feedback that we give our students. Next, we will go into the implications in the classroom and we will end with questions and discussion. So taking a look at our topic overview and framing. So our problem that we have here is that student teacher relationships play an important role in the classroom. Creating these meaningful relationships with your students is oftentimes challenging. And our hypothesis for this is that high teacher expectations and formative frequent feedback create positive student teacher relationships which lead to academic success. So let's take a look at some terms that we need to define here in order to really get a good groundwork um, for this presentation here. So firstly, we have the student teacher relationship, and this is the academic and professional relationship between the teacher and the student. A good student teacher relationship is associated with positive outcomes such as better school adjustment, positive social functioning, and high levels of academic achievement. Teachers should demonstrate that they care for the person of the student as well as their learning. Second, we have teacher expectations. And this is a teacher's perception of what a student is able to achieve daily. Teacher expectations have an impact on student achievement and success in the classroom. There are various ways in which we can provide students with our own expectations. However, high expectations for our students provide meaningful learning opportunities. And we'll hear more about this soon. And feedback, our third term to define here, feedback is information given to the student about their performance relative to learning goals and teacher expectations. The methods and phrasing of our feedback play an important role in the way a student will respond to the teacher and how the student perceives the student-teacher relationship between each other. And finally, we have differential teaching. Teachers may change their expectations based on students' perceived ability. For our students, it's important to have consistent and high expectations for our students. And Ms. Zappa is gonna tell us a little bit about this soon here. Okay, thank you, Tony. So um, to, as Tony mentioned, looking at teacher expectations. So differential teaching is when teachers may change their expectations based on students' perceived ability. But let's clarify what we mean by expectations. So in the classroom, teachers can have highly differential um, expectations or less differential in their expectations. So looking at two different studies, 
um, we can say that if teachers have high differential expectations, that's going to be more inconsistent for their student achievement. So teachers need to have high consistent expectations for all of their students. And it's these high expectation practices that will help to cultivate and form strong teacher to strong teacher student relationships. So um, differences in these and these expectations can explain um, a significant amount of the differences in the student achievement. So in classrooms where the expectations were less deferential, meaning more consistent across all classroom students, a smaller amount of the achievement differences occurred as a result of the teacher's actions and expectations. So this reveals to us the impact varying expectations in a classroom can have on students. Okay, so previous studies have found that teacher expectations can impact a student's academic achievement. And this is, they've shown that the differences in beliefs and practices between high and low expectation teachers impacts the learning environments that they're providing for students. So this looks like the classroom climate, the um, motivation, the evaluation, the teacher feedback, and the student autonomy. Um, and the ways in which high expectation teachers managed and taught their students differed from the beliefs and practices of their low expectation teachers. So looking at one specific, in, one specific study, a teacher's expectation intervention, um, this study specifically wanted to test the effects on student achievement when the teachers changed their practices to those of high expectation teachers and how that impacted student achievement in one school year. So they were specifically looking at will uh, teacher expectations um, an intervention on teacher expectations increase achievement for students in math and reading. And the study hypothesized that teacher participation, this intervention would increase um, student achievement. So there were two groups of 90 teachers in total and um, about half of those teachers were offered school PD. Um, and then the other half were put in these teacher expectation intervention workshops. And this was completely randomized. And then they, um, oof, okay, hold on. <laughs> so there were two groups totaling 90 teachers and these groups were completely randomized, but about half of these teachers were offered a school PD and the other half were offered uh, teacher expectation intervention workshops. And so in these teacher intervention workshops, they attended four separate workshops. They were also um, asked to self-analyze footage of their teaching. They also met with a, a partner throughout the school year to support the implementation of some of these interventions. And then um, they, at the end of the year, did a self-evaluation. Now, these workshops specifically were focusing on teaching behaviors of high expectation teachers. So looking at um, centered grouping and learning activities, the class climate, how to motivate students, evaluation, feedback, and student autonomy. And the students in their classroom, they completed three EASTL testings in reading and math throughout the course of the school year. So the results from these school, from these tests the students took um, showed that for both reading and mathematics, student achievement increased over the course of the year. Now, it's interesting to note that there was a positive small correlation between student engagement with the intervention and student achievement in mathematics, but the teacher engagement did not significantly predict the rate of change in reading performance over the year. So there were no um, significant differences in from the reading scores. Uh, the student study also discovered that high expectation teachers appeared to create a warmer classroom climate than low expectation teachers. Now, we created a visual representation of the standardized testing in reading and math that the students took at the beginning, middle, and end of the year. And if you look, the bars represent the average scores of these three uh, school year testings. So, um, as you can see with the intervention group, the math scores um, did increase. Something that's important to note about this study is that it shows high expectation practices can be taught to teachers and make a difference in student learning and relationships. Now, there might have been no difference in the reading scores because the other teachers were receiving PD. Um, it could have been potentially as a result of the grouping or parent expectations at home, but um, further research needs to be conducted. 
All right, so now we'll lead from expectations into an analysis of how feedback can also affect student achievement and um, student teacher relationships. So the first study we're going to take a look at involves 160 undergraduates at a large Midwestern university. These undergraduates participated in one working session with a researcher. They were separated into a four by four, um, sorry, a two by two grouping of expectations and feedback. So there were two expectation conditions, one where they were expected to succeed, another where they were expected to fail, and there were two feedback conditions. Either the undergraduates were given feedback or were not given feedback during the problem solving process. So an expecting success situation, the researcher would, researcher would have said, these problems are easy and we expect you to have no problem solving them. Whereas in the expecting failure condition, the researchers would say something along the lines of, these problems are difficult and you should expect to struggle. Don't worry if you solve them incorrectly. The undergraduates participated in a four-step problem solving process, taking a pretest and hearing the expectation priming. They, they completed four target problems wherein feedback was either given during the completion of these problems or not given. Then they were given an example, uh, a worked example instruction piece. And finally, they took a post-test containing five problems. So here the results are on the screen. There were two specific learning items targeting the student's achievement contained in the post-test. So on these two learning items, you'll see that the number of items the students got correct is on the y-axis. And along the bottom, we have two different groupings. There's the students who were in the expect success condition. This is easy, you'll do great. And in the expect failure condition, this is hard, don't expect to succeed. Then we see that there were the two feedback conditions. Either they received feedback in the dark blue or they did not receive feedback, the white bars. What we can see here, if we look at it, is that in the expect success condition, that is where feedback being provided was actually significant to the students. So the feedback effects were only significant when expectations were high. Overall, expectations for success had an effect on student confidence, but it did not have an overall effect on performance. That's only when those expectations were already set as being high. So what does this mean for us in implications? So if we look at the study, we can see that a potential mechanism for why we might have seen these results when there was an expected success condition could be that emotional response. Students who feel like they're told they're going to fail might start having self-fulfilling kinds of prophecies where being told to fail emits an emotional response and they might not try as hard or emotions might get in the way of their success. Additionally, this was conducted on a population of undergraduates who already just demonstrated pretty good math skills in the first place. Um, and it was also not on a particularly diverse sample of students. The design of the study is limited because it tested only their immediate performance on the problems. Um, and also it was administered by researchers. So this study is important because it tells us that High expectations are crucial to set before we give that feedback to students, but we're going to talk now about how the type of feedback that we give to students is what leads them beyond student achievement into those really form foundational student teacher relationships that can amplify the achievement we see in our students. So the types of feedback we want to be giving to students is a process based feedback. This means that it's about the effort and the completion on the task. This could include verification feedback such as yes that's right or no that's not right try again. It should also include task based criteria um, related to the task that the student is working on. It should not be person based like you are awesome at this. You are so smart. Instead, it should be based on the students demonstrated effort, their strategies for solving. Um, and it should also really be focused on promoting student self assessment. This is the highest level of feedback we want to get our students to. We want them thinking about them, their own selves um, and regulating their own um, performance on their tasks. Your feedback should also be clear and meaningful. 
Combining feedback like this with high expectations is where we really see student teacher relationships flourish. We don't want students to be considering um, their perceptions of student expect of teacher expectations as terms of my teacher likes me or doesn't like me. But if we can give them process based feedback, they're less likely to perceive expectations as liking or not liking. We also can find that if we give positive and praise based feedback about those processes when possible, that's where we'll see the student teachers relationships really succeed. All right, thank you, Christina. All right, so today what we're going to be doing is I'm going to be talking to you about the implications in the classroom. So there are three aspects that we're going to talk about with this. So here comes the first one. So here we have expectations. So when I say language is very important when giving your expectations, what I mean by that is you have to have a sort of no opt out and writers write language message in your classroom. So for instance, in my classroom, sometimes I would have a problem where I would ask students, I would ask students a question. And if one of them got it wrong, I'll be like, not quite, and then move on to another one. That's actually not what you're supposed to do. If someone, if you ask a question, you call on someone, you don't just let them say the wrong answer and move on. You actually say, mm, keep trying, let's try this. Let's, you can try and lead them into that. And that really helps students gain that, that confidence that they eventually got the right answer. Whereas beforehand, if you had done that, that would have said, well, I got it wrong. There's no way I would ever figure that out. You wanna be able to set kids up for, for success. The second part of this for expectations is grouping. So it's very important for teachers to have very flexible groups for all their students. You don't wanna just segment your kids and just have the high achievers all together and the low achievers all in their own little group because it doesn't really matter what you decide to name those groups to try and trick your kids and say, oh, oh this is the rainbow group. This is the, this is the robot group. You want to make sure you get. You want to make sure you really give those kids equal opportunities to interact with all their classmates because they will figure it out. The third part of this is rules. Now, we have to be positive and built together with the classroom. Your students really do care about learning, and they want to feel like they have a voice. So you have to make sure that you're really including them and in establishing the rules for your for your classroom. Fourth one is goals. So. We have some SMART goals that we talked about where I've heard some teachers say that they would just have little goals for their students to reach and they could surround their whole year's work around those reaching those goals. I personally love using contracts with my students. I would really have some of my students write out their expectations for themselves and I'd have them sign it. And I would have them check up on that every now and then. And I would have them talk to their parents about that too. It's a good little way to treat your kids like grownups and allow them to feel like they have a lot more leadership in terms of their, their learning. All right, so here comes the second one. Now we have feedback. Okay, so the first one is comments. So what that means by is you wanna have very short and succinct comments for your kids. You don't wanna write too much, and especially you don't wanna write much more than what your kids write because then it just becomes a little redundant. They don't get as much out of the corrections. Just focus on one thing. Second part of this is suggestions. You wanna give your kids challengeable but reachable goals. You wanna give them, again, maybe one or two things that they can really focus and work on. Now, knowledge and assimilation, okay? When, when I talk about knowledge, what I mean by that is you want kids to really be able to take on that, that information. You want them to have that, just some, something that they'll always remember. So for instance, if I would be teaching a social studies class, I'd want them to have the date 1776 and sim assimilate into their head. That would be the 4th of July and like Declaration of Independence. And that's something that they should always really know. You want kids to really be able to have some of this knowledge be second nature. So don't focus as much on right and wrong, really focus on just allowing them to have those good learning strategies. Now the last one, corrections. One way I like to do this in my classroom Sometimes I'll grade some of my students' writing and I'll give them a little checklist. It's like, okay, you did a great job, but here's some things that you could do that would really put you over the top, okay? I think something like that would really go a long way for helping our kids learn. All right, now here comes the third one. The last one we have, okay? So any if anyone's taught before, you'll know 
you can't really be successful unless you have a very caring environment. Well-being equals learning. That's very important, okay? It's very important for teachers to show just as much concern for their students' well-being as what you're teaching in the classroom. Now, individual. Try making your classroom a lot more individual focused for the student. Maybe when they come in, have them have their own little, little cubby, their own little desk, their own little decorations that they can put up. Let them know that this is a very comfortable environment that they can feel at home in. Now, control. What I mean by this is in my classroom, I had a bit of a hard time trusting my kids. Now I'd always try to micromanage them whenever they would do work. But then as the year went on, I decided to give them a lot more independence and let them work more on their own. And what I found is the students actually responded pretty well to that. Even the ones that would talk a lot really enjoyed having that extra responsibility and they responded accordingly and they worked hard to prove that they could do it. Now, the last one is grades. There has been a lot of studies and a lot of what we've talked about, how grades are really, are, can be very positively impacted by how well the teacher believes in them, how much responsibility they give them. So it's very important. And there, and there has been some very compelling research that shows that. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna pass the ball back over to my good friend, Tony Munzik to talk about some questions. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mankey. I appreciate that. Uh, to give you a glance at our references slide of the studies and research that we used uh, throughout the presentation here. But now we're going to give you a look at the questions that we have um, that we would love to discuss with you during our Q&A. So our first question that we have is who? Considering our students, is it fair to have such high expectations on students if they have been set up for failure in many ways? What? What strategies have you found useful to improve relationships with students in the classroom? And finally, how? How can teachers have equally high expectations for every student in class when capabilities are varied? Looking forward to hearing all of your response. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Take care.